Welcome to Bath Talks with Jim Bruce. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Bath Talks. Thanks for tuning in. I want to start out with some thanks. Just thank you for subscribing, thank you for watching, thank you for sharing. Thank you for the odd compliments on how I look in a bathtub. All of those things have been very encouraging, encouraging enough that I'm going to continue doing this for a while. Um, I like to talk about a lot of things. I don't talk about politics very often because it can, can become so vitriolic and it can become so hard to focus on any kind of a positive message. And frankly, that's not my strength anyway. I have a political opinion, but I'm not necessarily the right guy to get very deep. That's why I brought a guest with me today. Uh, my friend Walker Wool is something of a political wonk. He's one of the hosts of A Deeper Dive, a political podcast that you should check out. It's very smart stuff. Please welcome my guest, Walker Wool, everybody. Thanks for having me, Jim. Thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure. Let's start this way. What is A Deeper Dive? Deeper Dive is a podcast I do with uh, an old professor and a dear friend of mine, uh, Nick Dungy. Um, we talk about political philosophy, so it's not necessarily a left-right debate, it's more along the lines of Hobbes, Machiavelli, Locke, and how their writings and what they talked about four or five, six hundred years ago has sort of come into the fold and what it looks like now, and sort of their writings. We also do some Plato and, you know, along those lines, so it's, it's more of a philosophical podcast in political terms. It occurs to me that that's something that's so lacking from mm. the political landscape now when you talk about having nonpartisan conversations. If I can draw just an analogy to comedy, um, George Carlin. People often remember George Carlin as being a political comedian. Right. But look at his material. He wasn't. Right. What he was was he was a social comedian. Right. He made observations about, and by the way, this is no knock on political comedy, I think it's important, I just think there's something missing. So this is not, I don't want it to come across as if we're criticizing the voices that are there, mm -hmm. I think I just want to draw attention to the voices that are not there, really. Yeah, I mean, you can, as far as comedy goes, you know, uh, you, you know it well, I mean, there are a lot of still social comics, Louis C.K. jumps to mind, Sure. right, some of his stuff is just... It's not necessarily left, right, although he does do some anti-Trump stuff, but even before Trump, he was talking about, you know, like his great bit on Conan that I always remember about how, uh, you know, it's such a great time and nobody's happy. Right. And it was such a great social commentary yeah. on, on the modern times. And you that know, was, it was just interesting to me. A super good observation about the life we live in. And so I think if I'm reading it right, your podcast is about politics in the sort of general sense of the structure of it. Yeah, it's, it's sort of, so we sort of break down sort of what's going on. And, you know, if you, if you know history, you see things play out. And you sort of see that, oh yeah, we've been here before. I mean, a lot of people talk about unprecedented. I keep hearing unprecedented. We've been here before, Watergate. Um, we've had crazier um, Presidents, there have been crazier leaders throughout history, yeah. surprisingly. Yeah. But but people don't have a sense of a maniac on money. <laughs> There's a picture of a maniac. Yeah, on and, yeah, and, and, that, and, and the fact that Trump loves him so much. Yeah, so so uh, to study history is to know the future, right? I mean, I mean that's that's sort of the thing. And so when you look back, you sort of see things play out and go, oh, okay, this isn't this isn't as bad as all that we've been here before. I mean, I mean, I, I make this analogy all the time, right? We fought a war amongst the states. People are like, we've never been as this divided in history, the United States. Yeah, yeah, we have. We took yeah. arms against each other, you yeah. know, and fought over slavery. Yeah. That, that was pretty divided. And so I think people have to just get a sense yeah. of history to know politics. Since you brought it up, sure. can we need to collectively as a nation stop holding up the heroes of the South? We need to oh. stop doing that. Yeah, I. this is a very... Uh, it, it's interesting um, to me. I have a very specific opinion on this. Please. Um, so they just took a statue down in New Orleans of Robert E. Lee, right. uh, I believe. And, you know, these heroes of the South, people are like, oh, you're taking away our history. I don't want to take away history. I want to put it in a museum. Yeah. Because that's where it belongs. I don't want to put it in the public square. In the same way that the Germans don't want the swastika... On See, their... you draw that analogy. Let me let me make that analogy more cutting because okay. this is what I've been thinking. Okay, you put up that statue of mm -hmm. Robert E. Lee. That's not history. 
When you put up a statue of Robert E. Lee that shows this noble person, that's not what happened. In Germany, in Germany, they do have monuments to World War II, but you know what they don't have? They don't have a monument to the noble German soldier. They remember Dachau. Right. So if you're going to have a monument to the Civil War, it's the traitor's block. It's the chains. And and those no. exist, right? And those and those exist as yeah. part of that in the South. I've been through the South yeah. extensively. And, and those do exist, and people see that. Contextualize it. And there, is, and there is a whitewashing. To be fair, there is a whitewashing. I was recently in Durham, and I went to the old Lucky Strike plant, and the, and the tower is still up, and it says Lucky Strike. But what they've done is they've taken the entire... Uh, factory, and they've turned it into office workspace and restaurants and bars. And what they did it with the with the uh, drying floor, you know, where they used to dry the leaves, is they turned it into a basketball court. And I was like, oh, this is great. And then if you take another second, you go, oh no, wait, there were slaves drying tobacco here. Like right. this is a horrific place if you put it in context. So there is some whitewashing going on in the South. And we have to be careful of that as well. That's what I'm saying. But I think history still has a place. and, and I, I do too, but I'm saying if you do, nobody should be able to feel good. You shouldn't feel good about the South, their struggle to destroy the United States. You should feel good that they lost. Those weren't patriots. You know, and, and somebody is going to tell you his grandfather was a patriot because he was fighting for what he believed in. And so, for me... The yeah, but then, then, so the Redcoats were patriots. So then, who's not a patriot then? That's absurd. I, I understand what you're saying, but you, you also can't turn them into traitors right away. You can't turn them into villains. You can't turn them all into villains. Well, uh, I can see that. That's fair. You know what I don't... I don't see them as villains as so much as I see them as wrong. Yeah, there they were on the wrong side of history. So absolutely, they were on the wrong side of history. There are German soldiers from World War II who were absolutely brave, Yes. fought for something they believed in, didn't know how horrific things were, True. didn't consider their fellow man in the equation of fighting for German sovereign... There's a wonderful movie. Oh, the name escapes me. Forgive me, because we're doing this off the cuff. But there's a movie, World War II, where all the kids get f riled up, you know, for the German side. And then they actually go off to war. And they come back. And the, and, and the one kid who, you know, the teacher brings them in. Oh, tell us what's going on in the front. He's like, it's miserable. I hate it. And he's like, she's like, you're being unpatriotic. And every time a country is ready to go to war, they pull that movie off the shelves. Because it shows the horror yeah. of war. And it also shows how you can get riled up in it. Yeah. You know, like, we made enemies out of the Japanese in World War II. You yeah. know? And they made enemies of us. And they said things that were absolutely not true about us. And we said things that weren't true about them. But that was what you knew. And that's what you went to war on. Right. You know what I mean? And so, to, I don't blame the average soldier for going to war no, on information not. that he had. Now, the Robert E. Lees and stuff like that... They were generals in a Confederate army. The Confederate army stood from this year to this year. It was the governing body of these states for a couple of years. True. And so it does have its place in history. Yeah. And you have to acknowledge that place in history. I, I think you're right. I and, think and to judge it, I think, is a mistake as well. You just have to accept that it happened and learn the lessons from it. But good and bad needs to be left to each individual. I don't think as a society we condemn everything that true just because but, we won. But you don't exalt it either. One of the in New Orleans, uh, there was one of the African American fellows who lives there talked about. It, he goes, everybody would always talk about how they drive past these monuments and they would have feel this pride. And he said, I didn't feel I pride didn't, exactly. What I felt was this is my society that I live in today telling me, you know what. The war might be over, but we still think you belong in a particular place. Absolutely, and I think that's why you take those statues, you put them in a museum, and right. you tell the whole story. Tell the whole story, you're right. And that's the piece that's missing. Tell I feel pride because there, I've been told this story, I've been given this line about Southern pride, and yeah. how they were so brave, and they fought the, the aggressors from the North, and so they're still telling that story because those things are out there to still be told. If you pull them down, 
put them in a museum and tell the whole story. Well, now the next generation goes, well, wait, Grandpa, that's not really the way it happened. Right. And you sort of move forward from there. Yeah, you, you progress without forgetting your past through. Exactly. And, you know, this brings me to a bigger point. It's one of the reasons I came in the tub with you today is, and I think on a local level you'll see this, on a governmental level you see this, and this is what is, is sort of on, on my plate right now, is this idea, and it was a French philosopher who came up with it initially, it's been sort of uh, homogenized and moved along, but it's, we get the government we deserve, yeah. right? We as people, and I don't care who you are, if you're Russian, if you're Albanian, and whoever it is, you sort of get the government you deserve, right? Yeah. And so we as a democracy, we have this guy in the White House now, Trump, right? right? And, and we did this. Right. We, we did this, right? We as people, and to your point about the South, we, 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 we allow that to happen. We leave those statues up. Right. And finally somebody says, no, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to be bigger than that. We're going to move forward. And, and we did, the mayor of New Orleans gave a wonderful speech. Beautiful speech. Uh, Highly recommend it, by the way. Look it up. You yeah, no, it's a, it's a beautiful speech. And that's sort of, and, and, and so we move forward. But, but this thing, this, this government we deserve, you look at this guy, Trump, and you have to look at what we've become to have this guy in power. You know, there's a great meme going around on Facebook. Um, instead of building a wall, we should build a mirror and look at what we've become, right? Right. The guy, everything's 140 characters, which is what we've become, a country of 140 characters. Um, reality TV star. Like, we'd rather watch the Kardashians and then find out who's doing what, then watch Neil deGrasse Tyson or, or Bill Nye or any of those guys. Sure. Any of those major science guys. Um, you know, he doesn't read very well. He... There, there's can I tell you by instance? Sure. And the fact that anybody considers, no offense, Bill Nye's great, but that when we think of big scientists, think of Bill Nye, Bill Nye exactly. He's not, right. he's not a big scientist. I mean, right, but he's a smart man, he's a scientist. But I'm saying that when your go-to is the two guys you've seen on TV. On TV, thank you're you. You're not yeah. talking about Feynman, right? right. You're talking about any number you know, I just made my own point. Yeah, you Out really of sheer did. ignorance, I just made my own point. And you're not wrong. You're 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 ahead of the curve just by knowing those two names. But 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 my point. Yeah. And again, here we are. You know, Trump. They have to dumb down his briefings. And I've I've heard a report that they put his name in every paragraph, so he keeps reading. Because if you don't, he'll stop reading. Yeah. And they've shortened. He's at the NATO summit now. They've shortened the meetings because of his attention span. He can't keep an attention span. Yeah. This guy is in power because of what we've become. Yeah. Whether you voted for him or not. No, whether you voted for him or not. There was a collective participation in dumbing down society. Even if you yourself are pretty intellectual, I can think of ways I participate every day. Every you day. Have to we all yourself. do. We all do. And I, I, I want to make sure I'm being uh, bipartisan in this. I want to make sure that, I, I, you know, non-ideological. Hillary Clinton's the same way. When you look at her book, this book Shattered, it was a say her book, the book Shattered, her staffers talked about, openly talked about, why are we trying to elect this woman? Yeah. There was no, it was just ego. It was just hubris. You know, and again, this is what we've become, this sort of winner take all at, at whatever it cost, you know? She had 30,000 emails that were never accounted for. And, and you can blame Comey, not blame Comey, that exists. And I think you have to address that. And again, I think you have to look at, why can't we just tell the truth? Yeah. Why can't we be honest with the American people? Yeah. Why, why can't we do these things you made this in a way that I thought Sanders did, by the way? You made a, this point over lunch, and it, and it stuck with me, which is that um, one of the reasons to elect Hillary is a valid reason, which is, first, I like Hillary. I think she has some leadership qualities, but all the things you said are true. But one of the biggest things that was the promotion for her was first woman. Right. And you made the point that, yeah, but had we elected Sanders, would have been the first Jewish man to occupy the White House. And that wasn't the first thing, because the message was the first thing. And I started thinking about Obama. Obama, of course, it was amazing to elect the first African-American president. Right. But you know what? That wasn't his message. No. His message wasn't, I'm a black guy, so vote for me. Right. His message was, here's... My vision, you know. Yeah, yes we can. Yes we can. Open change. Right. And along with that bonus, this would be the first African. Because at that point, are you, you know, would you elect any guy? You're like, well, it could have been Barack Obama or, or Will Smith. Sure. No, it needed to be him, the guy with the vision. Whereas like I, if Elizabeth Warren were running. Right. 
you might have problems with her, but she's a principled human being. Mm -hmm. You'd be voting for a message, not just for her gender. Right. And really, isn't that what we want? Of course, uh, from our leaders, and that's, and that's exactly what we didn't have in this last election. Because, and again, if we turn the mirror on ourselves, that's our fault. How many, how many of us have that leadership? How many of us have that direction, that principle anymore? And how many the, of us just try to get away with whatever we can? And where's the courage in saying, let's pick the candidate who's got the best vision versus I think this person's the most electable? Because right. it does, it is a little disappointing that we keep going, we talk about electability versus like leadership. Right. And that's what leads to Trump. You talk about electability before you're talking about whether or not the person has something to offer the greater good. Exactly. And there are so, because this has been an evolution, right? We've sure. seen, this has been coming for some time now, sure. You had the Iran-Contra, you started Watergate, Iran-Contra. You, you can go down the line of all of these things. You sort of look at Bill Clinton. Um, you know, I make the argument that this that sort of um, uh, movie Wall Street is sort of, a, again, a mirror on us where, you know, the Michael Douglas character stands up and says, greed is good, and gives that speech in the go-go 80s. And, you, you know, this has been coming for a long time. Yeah. And this is, this is who, the ba this is what the baby boomers saw. This is how they grew up. This is what we've seen for so long yeah. now that it's going to take a real sort of tectonic shift to move us back to a place of principle, of character, you know, I have a lot of faith in this upcoming generation, but... I do too. But I think one of the things that has to happen, and this is really an appeal to anybody listening, because it really does start with individuals, is that you have to challenge yourself intellectually every day. You have to challenge your preconceptions. You have to say to yourself, what is it that I believe just because this is my breeding to partisanly believe this, and what is it that I'm believing because I took the time to intellectually analyze it? And, man, actual uh, logic, real logic isn't about any side. It's just about the facts. Yeah. It really is. And, um, and the only change that's ever going to happen is when we start from what's true versus what feels good. I want to, uh, if you don't mind, I want to finish up, I brought, there's a little quote I'd like to read to you. Uh, it's a, it's an old Greek proverb. Uh, a society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they will never sit in. I think it's a, I think it's something we should return to. Agreed. Um, I invite you to have conversations and maybe in a bath or maybe just around a table at dinner, but I invite you to have conversations, and by the way, conversations are when somebody else is talking and you're listening. It's not just when you're talking. Thanks for tuning in. Let's enjoy our bath. Bath Talks is a Jim Bruce production. Bubbles provided by Amori Arce. If you enjoyed Bath Talks, click subscribe.